Prepare to see a different side of leadership as we delve into the lives of world leaders who weren't just powerful in politics, but also sculpted their bodies into symbols of strength, not just ruled with an iron fist, but also ruled the iron in the gym or hardened their fist on heavy back. Being a leader used to mean being someone to aspire to, someone who could inspire. Many believe it still should be. We see an obvious correlation in people not just preferring healthier, but also fitter and taller candidates. From 1789 to 2012, the tallest candidate won more than half of presidential elections and received the majority of the popular vote in 67% of those elections. But approval ratings rise and fall related to the health, physique, and stature of leaders as we will see later with FDR, King Henry VIII, Woodrow Wilson, Reagan, and so many more. So we're gonna break this up into three sections. The fittest world leaders. Some of these are really, really cool, like high-level athletes, Olympians, bodybuilder physiques, crazy. Some of these people I had no idea existed. The weakest leaders and the kind of comical connection to their physique, their decisions, and their approval ratings. I'm going to put these folks together in a battle to see who would win in a fight because this is my channel and I think that would be funny. And then we will wrap it all up with some undeniable things that need to be considered with world leaders that hopefully will be in everyone's mind next time they vote, regardless of your country or affiliation. I'm also gonna give them all physique, self-defense, and athleticism ratings out of 10 because again, this is my channel and I think it will be funny. So I wanna roast the ones that look like a soggy bag of milk. I'm gonna remain unbiased here. I'm gonna stay pretty apolitical here, but if you want to get political in the comments, I'm not going to stop you. All of these topics will be covered when the individual was at their peak because, you know, time makes fools of us all. If this is your first time here, I make bi-weekly deep dives into fitness pop culture trends as well as holistic bodybuilding and powerlifting content, so make sure to subscribe to hear more of that. This week's Amazon gift card giveaway. Put a comment under this video telling me who you think is the most and least fit. Also, feel free to argue with me if you'd like, because this is going to be a fun one, and people are going to get very opinionated, I assume. And with all that out of the way, guys, my name is Andrew with Pride, episode 60. Let's go. do this portion of the video in the style of Roman helmet guy from TikTok because I think it's funny, but I will compile it all how I usually do after. Oh, y'all don't know about the most dangerous president in the world? He was the president of Mongolia from 2017 to 2021 and holy shit. Despite being a world leader, he has got a physique that is better than 80% of the people you see at the gym. He is also a world champion in Sambo and was the 2008 Olympics coach for Mongolia, where Naidan Tushinbayar won the first gold ever for Mongolia in judo. As a side note, Naidon went from national hero to now being in prison for the murder of his best friend and fellow teammate. The Mongolian president himself was such a skilled judoka that Shinzo Abe, the now deceased prime minister of Japan, actually said he wanted to see him and Putin, a fellow judo master, have a judo bout together, stating, it could be interesting. And while it is unlikely that will ever happen, it is a testament to his skill because Putin isn't a pushover, as you'll see when we cover that later. He's also likely one of the few, if not the only world leader to be able to bench two plates. And he is turning 60 this year. When you are this big, this strong, and this skilled as a martial artist, they don't just call you the most dangerous president in the world, they call you Kaltma Batulga. Arguably the most powerful British monarch the world has ever known. When Winston Churchill first saw her as a baby, he said she has an air of authority and reflectiveness that's astonishing in an infant. When she began to rise to prominence, many politicians were stating, she's only a girl, what can she do? She ascended to the throne months later. A woman known for averaging 10,000 steps a day, meeting over 4 million people and regular horse riding, she has somehow never been seen to sweat. Known to waste absolutely no energy, with an American official stating, she stands completely still, as if she were looking inward and recharging her batteries. Upon turning 18, she joined the military as the only member of the royal family to be a full-time service member, and in only five months was promoted to captain. When you are never sick, rule for 70 years, and have temperance even Marcus Aurelius would look up to, they don't just call you the most powerful British monarch, they call you Queen Elizabeth II. The manliest American president ever once stated, boxing is the best exercise a man can take. It teaches him self-reliance, hardihood, and the value of a quick decision. Then practiced so often, he became a regular sparring partner of the heavyweight champion, John L. Sullivan. 
When he was giving a speech in Milwaukee, he was shot in the chest with a 32 caliber bullet from 15 feet away, missing his heart by barely an inch. He then finished his speech, went to the hospital to have the bullet removed with no sedative, and even gave a speech to the press from his hospital bed. In 1905, when he learned of judo, he invited the Japanese champion, Jigoro Kano, to the White House to demonstrate his art. He was so impressed with the sport, he began to study it himself. He even wrote about it in his book, The Winning of the West. Upon seeing the beauty of the American wilderness, he created five national parks and 150 national forests, cementing his place as the co-founder of the National Park Service. As a sickly and weak child, he overcame asthma and other limitations, which led to his speech, The Strenuous Life, where he told American citizens, I wish to preach not the doctrine of ignoble ease, but the doctrine of the strenuous life, calling on all Americans to strive to do great things and to succeed in them, and thus to be worthy of the high places which have been given to us to fill. When you survive assassination attempts, learn every martial art you can, protect the beauty of the outdoors, and popularize the idea of the strenuous life. They don't just call you the man in the arena. They call you Teddy Roosevelt. When one of the greatest emperors Rome ever knew considered what it truly means to be a man, he wrote, waste no more time arguing about what a good man should be, be one. When he realized how running cleared his mind and how wrestling strengthened his body, he encouraged all of his subjects to exercise regularly. Through managing a life of asthma, headaches, and gut issues, he came to say, the healthy body is the guest chamber of the soul. The sick body is its prison. When leading a group of angry troops, he spoke patience, stating, the best remedy for anger is delay. When betrayed by his general, he responded with poise, the nearer a man is to a calm mind, the closer he is to strength. When training his son on the importance of perseverance, he wrote, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. When you're guiding an empire, leading the Stoic Renaissance, and know that the only way to overcome an obstacle is to go through it. They don't just call you the last great Roman emperor. They call you Marcus Aurelius. When the first lady saw her schedule left no time for physical fitness, she reworked her entire calendar around it to set a healthy example for her daughters. When faced with record obesity rates in the United States, she opened the White House for public fitness. When she was shamed for having muscular arms, she doubled down and hired a personal trainer to grow them even more. When you pioneer the belief that women can be strong and sexy, they don't just call you the 44th first lady, they call you Michelle Obama. When this world leader, tired of being picked on at school, he picked up judo as a way to defend himself, practicing it religiously. When he saw a chance to fight for his country, he took it and joined their secret service. Three years later, he gained his black belt in judo, and five years after that, he became ranked eighth in the world. Over decades of hunting, he has become a skilled marksman, using it for both slaying animals and tranquilizing them for treatment. In his late 50s, he tested his iron will by swimming in frozen lakes regularly. When you rule the largest country in the world through fear and admiration for nearly two decades, they don't just call you the president of Russia, they call you Vladimir Putin. When this man was faced with the potential life of luxury connected to his name, he instead risked it all in a pursuit to save American lives by pushing against many mainstream health narratives. When he realized the importance of a clean environment for keeping citizens strong and healthy, he released pages and pages of research to get it protected, effectively damning a former president's efforts to exploit it. At nearly 70 years old, he was seen at Muscle Beach repping out push-ups and incline pressing over 100 pounds with a physique rivaling Arnold Schwarzenegger's at the same age. When you are piled on by every mainstream media outlet, but keep going and build your greatest physique in your seventh decade, they don't just call you the 47th president hopeful. They call you Robert F. Kennedy Jr. When this world leader was only 20 years old, he won his first major bodybuilding competition and was crowned Mr. Universe. Just a few years later, he used this momentum to start a Mr. Olympia streak that lasted half a decade and one final time in 1980. Using his newfound notoriety, he took up acting. Despite the naysayers saying he couldn't act and his accent was too thick, he used his size and determination to become one of the biggest action stars of all time in back-to-back -back blockbusters. With this global fame and one-of-a-kind physique, he started various sports and exercise festivals and conventions to spread his fitness methodology around the world. When he became interested in politics, he defied the odds, making his first public office the leader of the fifth largest economy in the world. When you conquer your body, public office, and Hollywood, they don't just call you the governor, they call you Arnold Schwarzenegger. There's a few consistencies you can see here across most of them. You'll see a similar one on the other end of the spectrum too, but did you notice any? It seems like nearly all of these leaders were bullied, learned some kind of combat sport, or made it their mission to spread the fitness bug to as many people as they could. But what about the weakest ones? What is it that makes them physically weak? How did it affect their rule or term? And most importantly, which of you are gonna cry in the comments because I called someone you like weak? Wait. This king was initially known for his athleticism and jousting skills in his youth. And if you've ever seen jousting, it is not just a matter of physical strength to hold a 15 pound and 10 foot pull, but also the mental strength of sprinting potentially to your death. Some of you might be hearing 15 pounds and scoff, but if you've ever seen the Thor's hammer challenge with a barbell, 
you know that leverage is either your best friend or your worst enemy. It is in King Henry VIII's later years where we see the significant weight gain and health issues arise and with it, his authoritarian rule. His obesity and numerous health problems were attributed to his lavish lifestyle and excessive consumption at almost any expense, including his wives and his kingdom. When you cannot rule yourself, how will you rule the kingdom? He died due to many obesity-related causes. Idi Amin, the so-called butcher of Uganda, originally enlisting in a wing of the British military, quickly rose through the ranks, used his military prowess to overthrow the Ugandan government, and took the presidency for himself. This led to eight years of torture, military imprisonment, ethnic cleansing, all of these evils to parallel a life of excess food, weight, and women. Idi would die at 80 years old due to several obesity-related comorbidities, with his wife stating he weighed at least 220 kilograms, nearly 500 pounds. King Louis XVI, he was known to be frail and sickly as a child and had a number of health problems through his life. You'd think this was the beginning of a comeback story, but the longer he ruled, the wider his waist became, and the more publicly people disapproved of him until he was executed at 38 years old, never achieving the possible comeback he could have made. Okay, I'm kind of going to cut the Roman helmet guy shtick. Middle of the road is basically where this next leader lies. Not incredibly fit, not very unhealthy, just average, with maybe a questionable mind, as if it has been an afterthought. And I swear to God, if anybody uses this to make a pun about being forgetful, I'll probably say nothing because it is funny. But yeah, Joe Biden, generally fit, generally healthy diet, but he seems to be plagued with falling related injuries. Granted, he's nearly 80 years old at this point, but even in his prime, he never really looked any more or less healthy at any point. It's easy to shame excess when it causes obesity. But there is something uniquely upsetting to the mind knowing someone just remained average. There really isn't much about Biden's physical health out there besides these various times he's fallen down from stairs, tripped going upstairs, fell off of a bike, and I could probably keep going on and on a few more times about that, but falling in advanced age is a major contributor to death. In fact, the CDC has falling-related injuries listed as the number one injury-related death for people over 65. And while falling can be due to many different things, including neurological issues and medication, exercise is a strong hedge against these injuries. Simply put, one broken hip can be the difference between a few years or a few more days left on this planet. And it begs the question, if you had only the choice between a healthy body or a healthy mind, which would you choose? Which leads us into this next person, and maybe that will help some of you answer this. Probably in the comments, super civilly. Like, people will definitely not be arguing and talking shit in the comments at all, not even a little bit. That's right, guys, the person the other half of the viewers are gonna be crying about in the comments, Trump. Something of a paragon of laziness and gluttony, oftentimes outwardly so, with pride. Trump seems to have had no record of health issues as a child and was instead quite healthy and born into a luxurious life. It is his exercise routine that is truly interesting though, stating, oh God, do I do this in the impression? I get exercise, I mean I walk, no. I get exercise, I walk, I this, I that, I run over to a building next door. I get more exercise than people think. I don't quote him to say walking is an exercise. Getting 10,000 steps a day is no small feat, assuming he's doing so. But when coupled with this next quote, it seems to be something of an aversion to exercise, unless it's walking from one hole golfing to the next. A lot of people go to the gym. They'll work out for two hours and all, Trump said. I've seen people. Then they get their new knees when they're 55 years old and they get their new hips and they do all those things. I don't have those problems. In the book Trump Revealed, he explained his battery theory. Basically, there's a finite amount of energy or life force, and if you use it on sports and exercise, you will deplete it and die. Aside from the fact quite literally the opposite is true. Maybe he just sees it as time away from his work, but then again, we know exercise also improves the function of your brain. So Trump has not been shy about his preference for fast food and less healthy food options. During his campaign and presidency, he was reported to have a fondness for items like hamburgers, fried chicken, diet soda. Oddly enough, he doesn't drink, but talking about his love of fast food honestly kind of just feels like a cheap dunk after the infamous White House fast food buffet for a college football team. Again, to give the most generous conclusion possible, he's busy. He doesn't have time to cook, but oh wait, he has personal chefs, so never mind. His weight being supposedly around 250 during his presidency and now supposedly around 215 as of getting booked into Fulton County would be impressive, but I don't know that either of those numbers are fully verifiable. So now back to that question. If you had to choose between a dwindling mind or a sluggish body, which would you choose? We've seen several examples of both here. Would you want something more akin to that of Stephen Hawking? Brilliant, but no mobility without assistance? Or a functioning body, but a slowly degrading mind? And whatever your answer for that is, I'm just gonna guess who you voted for because I don't know, I think it'll be funny. Now for the ratings. One being soggy bag of milk, 10 being Ziz with a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And of course, 
the final fight to say who I believe at their peak is the fittest world leader in all of history and who is the laziest. So we have Kaltma Batulga, a multi martial arts master with an off season bodybuilder frame. Solid nine out of 10. That dude is an absolute monster. Queen Elizabeth, a woman of astonishing will and endurance, but a fight to the death, even at her peak, is not going in her favor, unless she stays strapped for it, of course. Teddy Roosevelt, a practitioner of many martial arts, a wild man, a rough rider, survivor of assassination attempts, and preacher of the strenuous life, nine out of 10. Marcus Aurelius, the stoic emperor, a master of his mind and a man who encouraged an entire kingdom to exercise and learn self-defense, seven out of 10. Michelle Obama, a woman with Python-like arms that were so jacked, people have called her a man, but with no fighting experience, four out of 10. Vladimir Putin, judo master, master of who knows what else through his time in the KGB, nine out of 10. RFK Jr., a man who went beyond the legacy of his last name and built a peak physique in his twilight years, seven out of 10. And finally, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the face of bodybuilding, the face of 80s action heroes, but unqualified in any hand-to-hand -hand combat, eight out of 10. The strongest world leader, undoubtedly, unquestionably, undeniably is, is Kaltma Batulga. I mean, if I met this man in a dark alley and he asked for my wallet, I would instead bring him to the ATM. If he told me one more rep, I'd try to give him three. I honestly am in awe of the physical and athletic skill that this man boasts. And I think as far as physicality, he is probably the most inspirational leader here. For the weakest, we have King Henry VIII, the obese glutton and womanizer, Idi Amin, the 500 pound collector of war crimes, King Louis XVI, just purely unimpressive, Biden the clumsy and Trump the lazy. I know some of y'all are gonna love that I just called them that. I think we know the obvious answer here, guys. Put in the comments, let's see if you guess the same one as me. It is so clearly, so obviously, without a single question, the absolute undisputed king of the soggy bag of milk club is, more often than not, the leaders that were respected or admired in a way seem to have a stake firmly placed in health, exercise, and general wellness. There seems to be an air of confidence or a capability that comes from personal fitness, and it likely has a part in their commitment to follow through for what they say they'll do. When we look at leaders like King Henry VIII, who was at one point fit, athletic, and well-liked, to then become obese, tyrannical, and unhealthy, is it really so odd to speculate that success and approval as a leader is correlated, if not causal, with your fitness? When I pose this question to all my followers, should world leaders be fit? 82% said yes. Should world leaders at least be obviously healthy? 95% said yes. Does the health of a politician impact your vote? 72% said yes. And some of you voted for this on YouTube as well. So why do our votes not seem to reflect that in practice? But our approval ratings do. We see Reagan's approval ratings go up when he jokes about his assassination attempt, giving a speech in Berlin he heard what he thought was a gunshot, stating, missed me. Amir missed me. <clears throat> But we see his ratings go down with what some called the early appearance of his Alzheimer's. FDR being admired for how he handled his polio and paralyzation, but approval decreased as he became more frail toward the end of his fourth term. When a leader becomes sick or unhealthy, they will first receive sympathy and concern. But if things continue to trend downward, questions will arise about if they're fit for the job. As I've said in many videos, when you see a fit person, you can make a few assumptions. This person has perseverance. They understand delayed gratification and they seem to have a positive set of priorities. When we look at those in the weaker category, we can assume they are losing their battle with time, which can't always be helped, or that their priorities are elsewhere. But as a world leader, personal chefs have been around for centuries. They have the highest access to health and exercise professionals. We know that excess makes us fat. So to be an obese or unhealthy world leader is almost surely a sign that this person chooses gluttony, laziness, and food above their health. So if they can't prioritize their body, a thing they only get one of, well, can they really take care of millions? These social fitness topics are crazy, huh? Was I fair here? Did I give it an even look from every side? I hope so. And I also hope you check out the video that is linked up at the top over here. That was the most recent episode of this podcast that you will love. Or there's this one down here. That's my most recent video to see what I've been up to lately. I'll see you there, later.